The Pastor and the Prelate, Part 4, or 5, whatever it is. The Prelate's Objection. The Prelate will still object that you were more wise to quit the name of conscience in matters so indifferent as the controverted articles and others of that sort be than to still to talk of conscience, conscience, that you are but a part of Puritans. They are so precise and singular beyond your neighbors in matters indifferent. The pastor's answer. The prelate persuading to put away conscience is not unlike the fox, who through his evil guiding, having lost his tail, would have persuaded all his neighbors to part with theirs. It's an uncomely and unprofitable burden that all being like himself, his deformity might no more appear. A good conscience would plead God, please God in all things, in substance and ceremony, but with due proportion. It first and most standeth at camels, and yet next it straineth at gnats. When the light of God's truth makes them discernible, when he calls us precisions, precisions, he is quite mistaken. For he that is so self-precise that he would rather part with the purity of God's worship and a good piece of the truth too, than want a compliment of his lordly dignity or a piece of this worldly commodity or a dish of his delicacy. And not he that is so precise in the members of God's worship, wherein he hath no power to be liberal, that he will forsake all that to follow Christ. He and no other is the right precision. He called her pastors and her professors Puritans, and consequently her heretics. But blessed be God, cannot name their heresy. They are still in profession, that which he has not long since, when he was farther from heresy than is now. This culminy constraineth us to distinguish between two sorts of Puritans. The one is the old heretical Puritan, who from the author of the, his sect was called Novatian, and from his heresy, Catharist, or a Puritan. Such a one our pastor is not, for, first, the Puritan denied the baptism of infants. Their pastor waiteth on baptism as a special part of his calling, which the prelate doth not. Second, the Puritans had their own prelates, and liked of prelacy. The pastor in this is no Puritan, but the prelate the Puritan. Third, the Puritan condemned second marriage as unlawful. The pastor maintaineth the honor of marriage against the Puritan, the papist, and the prelate's manifold matrimonial transgressions. Fourth, the Puritan denied reconciliation, in some cases, to penitence. The pastor would be glad to see the prelate's repentance, notwithstanding his great defections, and that in a time of peace, without the least essay of persecution, and therefore our pastor is not a Puritan. The other sort is the new nickname Puritan in our times, wherein the papists call it Puritanism, to oppose the Roman hierarchy. The Arminian accounteth it Puritanism to defend God's free grace against man's free will. The formalist thinketh it Puritanism to stand out against conformity. The civilian, not to serve the time. And the profane thinketh it essential to the Puritan to walk precisely, and not to be profane. And so essential is it, indeed, that if all were profane, there would be no Puritan. For the profane and the Puritan are opposed. He then is the new Puritan, that standeth for Christ against Antichrist, that defendeth God's free grace against man's free will, and would have everything done in the house of God according to the will of God, which is his greatest heresy. That seeketh after the power of religion in his heart, and this is his intolerable singularity, and that stands at the staff's end against the sins of the time, and this is his pride. And thus, after this way, that, that the world called, calleth heresy, serveth he, the God of his fathers, who have all been Puritans in, of this stamp since the beginning. Abel, who was hated for his holiness. Enoch, who walked with God. Noah, that was a perfect man in his generation. Heber, that made Peleg's name a testimony, that he was free of the building of Babel. Moses, that he stood upon a hoof. Mordecai, that would not bow his knee. Daniel, that would not hold his window shut. <coughs> Eliezer, that would not eat one morsel. Paul, that would not dispense with one hour 
nor with the, any, an appearance of evil. Marcus Aureli, Marcus Athenusus, that would not redeem his life with the giving of a half penny to idolatry. Cain's Sulpius, who is not even esteemed by the pagans a good man, but he that was a Christian, etc. Were they living at this time, they would not escape the censure and would be accounted good men if they were not Puritans. The widow of Serapta, who entertained Elijah, the Shunammite, the hostess of Elisha. Hannah, who for multiplying prayers and pouring out her heart before God was rashly censured to be the daughter of Belial. Anna, the widow who served God with fasting and prayer night and day and spake of Christ. The godly woman who waited on Christ, ministered unto him of their substance, and told the apostles of his resurrection. Lydia, that constrained the apostles to abide with her. Lois and Eunice, that had a care that her children should have grace. The elect lady, the famous Hilgardus, who, who lived in the tw 12th century. Macthedes, Elizabeth the German, and many more who censured the corruptions of the Kirk and especially of the prelates of those times, and prophesied of the Reformation, which they longed to see, were they now living, would be censured for holy sisters and dining Puritans, that the rock and spindle had been fitter for them. Can any man or woman be vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked? Second Peter 2. Be stirred up in the spirit against idolatry? Acts 17. Be hot in religion? Romans 3. Fervent in spirit? Romans 12. Walk precisely? Ephesians 5. Fear an oath? Make the Sabbath his delight. Love the brotherhood, 1 Peter 2. Take the kingdom of God by violence, Matthew 11. And keep a good conscience in all things, Acts 4, uh, 24. And not be made the drunkard song, the byword of the people. And mocked for a Puritan. It was the saying of Petrarch. Quote, Simplicity careth the name of foolishness, malice the name of wisdom, and good men are so mocked that almost none can be found to be mocked. Part 4. <clears throat> the pastor and prelate compared by the Reformation and proceedings of our own Kirk. The disciplined government of the Kirk at first began to be reformed and the prelate to be cast out. The pastor proceedeth in the point of reformation and the prelate in the avarice and ambition. At last, prelacy is rooted out with consent of the whole Kirk. The Kirk now reformed in doctrine and discipline used with their authority against all sorts of sins till men of Episcopal disposition make a new division again. The pastor standeth to the Reformation against Episcopatus, with the prelate attained to at last by many degrees of much working. The way of the pastor's Reformation and the prelate's defection, very contrary. The pastor beareth witness against the several degrees of defection, and fearing a charge in the worship of, change in the worship of God, which the prelate entereth upon so soon as the government is altered, and he comes to his power. The pastor resolved to the constant to the end against all heresy and corruption which is entering every day with a prelate's misgovernment. Objection. The superintendents in the beginning were prelates. Answer. Showing particularly that the superintendents were not prelates. That's his introductory statement. As no family or civil society where the fundamental laws are neglected, and the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are followed, can continue long except it be reformed, even so the Kirk of God, through the disregard of the laws of God and the direction of Scripture, through the ambition and covetousness of Kirkman, did fall away so far from the first integrity that there was a necessity of reformation and nothing more certainly looked for and more plainly foretold a long time before any of our reformers or Luther himself came into the world. This reformation that could no longer be delayed was often urged, but never likely to be obtained in a general council, nor with consent of the clergy and court of Rome, to whom reformation was a certain ruin. And therefore, in several kingdoms, countries and states of the Christian world, it was wonderfully wrought by the Lord's mighty power and his weak servants. Such were, were amongst others, Baldus of Frankfurt, Huss of Bohemia, Jerome of Prague, Luther of Germany, Wycliffe of England, and Arnox of Scotland, whereupon it came to pass that although one part of Christian, Christendom knew not what another was doing, yet they all agreed, as many be seen in the harmony of the confessions published to the world, in the most essential and fundamental matters of faith, because the Lord was master of that work, but had also their own differences and degrees of reformation. Because men were the instruments, and they were not angels, but men that were to be wrought upon, for whose diverse dispositions and sundry nations there behooved to be di diverse, diverse disadvantages to the work. We are not rigid censors of other reformed kirks, nor are we separatists from them. But this we think, that a twofold duty lieth upon us and upon all, whatsoever be the measure of reformation. <laughs> 
One is, I'll be at there be ever some Catholic moderators that will be Tristers betwixt us and Rome and think to agree Christ and Antichrist. That we all with one heart praise God for separating us from Sodom, resolving never to return again, where there be so many heresies, both against the common principles and particular articles of faith. So manifold idolatry, both against the first and second commandment, so proud a hierarchy as can neither stand with the spiritual kingdom of Christ nor the civil kingdoms of princes, and so bloody a tyranny against all who believe their heresies, to practice their idolatry, and to be slavish to their hierarchy. Returning to any point of their profession is an approbation of their cruelty against them that have denied it. And whosoever approve their worship, they bring upon themselves the blood of so many saints and faithful martyrs of Christ, who have testified the word of God, and have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. The other duty is that albeit there be ever some Adiophorus, who for their own particular ends make many things and show many more things to be indifferent in the worship of God, that under this pretext they may bring them back that have been advanced before them in the work of reformation. That we all praise God with one heart for the measure that every one hath attained unto. And they that are behind in reformation, whatsoever their outward splendor be, envy not them who have, who have run before, or study to draw them back to their degree, lest both return to Rome and that all against all impediments press forward to farther perfection. Either reforming somewhat according to the pattern, there being no staying neither for the Christian nor for the Kirk. The Kirk of Scotland hath little cause to be pleased with herself when she looketh upon her late sudden and shameful defection, but great and singular cause to praise God when she looketh to his gracious dispensation. For Scotland, albeit far from Jerusalem, was one of the first nations that the light of the gospel shone upon when it appeared to the Gentiles, and one of the last that kept the light when the shadows of the hills of Rome began to darken the earth. So when the sun came about again at the Reformation, if this blessed light shone upon others, all that had eyes to see both at home and abroad have seen and said that it, should fairest, that it shone fairest upon us. Divine Providence delighting to supply the defect of nature with abundance of grace and to make this out, out other side of the earth lying behind the visible sun with the clear and comforting beams of the sun of righteousness to be the sunny side of the Christian world whereof they following the following these following testimonies are sufficient proof one of Mr. George Weishart martyr this realm shall be illuminated with the light of Christ's gospel as clearly as ever was the realm since the days of the apostles the house of God shall be built in it <clears throat> yea it shall not lack whatsoever the enemy imagined to the contrary the very top stone, the glory of God shall evidently appear and shall once triumph in despite of Satan. But alas, if the people shall be after unthankful, then fearful and terrible shall be the plagues, be that that follow that shall follow. History of the Kirk of Scotland, page 108. Another of Beza. Quote, this is a great gift of God that ye have brought into Scotland together pure religion and good order, which is the band to hold fast the doctrine. I heartily pray and beseech for God's sake, hold fast these two together, so that you may remember that if one be lost, the other cannot, be long, cannot long remain. As bishops brought forth popery, so false bishops, the relics of popery, shall bring into the world Epicureanism. Whosoever shall have the Kirk safe, let them beware of this past, of this pest. And seeing ye have timely dispatched it in Scotland, I beseech you never admit it again albeit it flatter with the show of the preservation of unity, which hath deceived many of the best of the ancients. <coughs> End of quote. A third of the body of confession of the Kirk. Quote, it is the rare privilege of the Kirk of Scotland before many in which the respect her name is famous, even among strangers, that about the space of four and fifty years without schism, let, uh, let be heresy she hath kept and held fast unity and purity of doctrine. <clears throat> The greatest help of this unity of the mercy of God was that with the doctrine of the discipline of Christ and his apostles, as it is preached in the word of God, was by little and little together resumed, according to that discipline. So near as might be, the whole government of the Kirk was disposed. By this means, all the seeds of schisms and errors, <coughs> as soon as they began to bud and show themselves, and their very breeding and birth was smothered and rooted out. The Lord God of his infinite goodness grant unto the king most gracious majesty to all the rulers of the Kirk, to the powers that are nurses of the Kirk, that according to the word of God they may keep perpetually that unity and purity of doctrine. Amen. <clears throat> End of quote. 
The fourth is of King James, our late sovereign. Quote, <coughs> The religion professed in that in this country, wherein I was brought up and ever made possession of, and which is my son ever to continue in the same, as the only true form of God's worship, etc. I do equally love and honor the learned and grave men of either of these opinions, that like better the single form of policy in our Kirk than the many ceremonies of the Kirk of England. I exhort my son to be beneficial to the good men of the ministry, praising God that there are presently a sufficient number of good men of them in this kingdom. And yet, are they all known to be against the form of the English Kirk? End of quote. That's from King James, Basilicon Doron. He praised God and he was born to be a king and the sincerest Kirk in the world, etc. Assembly, 1590. The prelates themselves and the maintainers of conformity dare not for shame open their mouths against the word of God in the Reformation and against the purity of their mother Kirk. And therefore... <clears throat> would have her open her mouth in the defense of their hierarchy and ceremonies, and to rest her authority in proceedings to that sense. Let us then ask of herself whether she liketh the pastor or the prelate. Number one, the pastor and men of God, at the acceptable time of restoration, as they were moved by the, scripture, by the Spirit of God, labored to reform not only the doctrine, sacraments, and whole worship of God, but also the discipline and whole government of the house of God, by abolishing the jurisdiction of prelates and all that Roman hierarchy, as is manifest by their acknowledging no other ordinary and perpetual office bearers in the Kirk but pastors, doctors, elders, and deacons. <coughs> That's from Book of Discipline. By the petitioning that the rents of the prelates and their train should be converted to other uses, by their subscribing the Helvetic Confession, 1566, which censures prelacy for the, for the invention of men, and by the letters which they received from foreign Kirks congratulating them that they had timely purged the Kirk of this proud prelacy, that they had received with the doctrine the di discipline of Christ and his apostles, and willing, and obtesting them to wear the pest of prelacy, as they loved the wheel of the Kirk. The prelate, not only in respect of his popish religion, but also in respect of his papal and episcopal jurisdiction, was one of the great evils that cried for reformation of the Kirk. And therefore, albeit he kept still the title, and rent the rent and the civil place of the prelates, which the Kirk could not take from him, and which many maketh, to, uh, maketh many to mistake his descent, ecclesiastical authority was so far abolished that neither were, were their successors designed to such prelates as continued obstinate papists, nor was Episcopal authority continued in their persons that were converted, nor were superintendents ordained to be new prelates. Only some of the converted prelates, for want of, me of means to furnish others, were designed to be commissioners of the Kirk as other ordinary pastors were, but with bad success. For never one of them did good to the Kirk. Number two. <clears throat> and he's got down here. To these, the superintendents were subject by an act of assembly. 1562. Number two. The pastor and the men of God, proceeding in the work of Reformation, acknowledged no government of the Kirk by the lordly domination of prelates, but by the common consent and authority of assemblies, which were of four sorts, national, provincial, parochial, and presbyterial. The lineaments of the last were drawn from the first when the weekly assemblies were appointed for exercise of discipline and interpretation of scriptures, but were not, nor could be, nor not be, accomplished and perfectly established till the light was spread, and particular kirks were planted in several quarters and corners of the land, that they might make a number and conveniently assemble in presbyterial meetings. The prelude is restless, proceeds whether his avarice and ambition carry him and willing in those times whether to be titular or a Tolkien as he was then named to be nobody above his brethren it's a reference to the Tolkien bishops uh, the Tolkien was a, a stuffed cow uh, a fake cow designed I forget it was designed to help the other cow gild milk or something he taketh upon him the title of bishop with a small part of the rent, permitting the greater part to my lord, whose bishop he was, and proudly again arrogates authority over the kirk. Number three, the pastor and men of God, learning not from Geneva, but from scripture and daily experience, that the government of prelates was full of usurpation and all sorts of corruption, where if many did complain that it had no warrant, and was never like to have any blessing from God, resolved at last to strike at the root that was Edinburgh, 1575. And therefore, after many disputations in private and public, consultations of the greater divines of other Reformed Kirks, and after long and mature deliberations, the second book of discipline 
uh, pronouncing the jurisdiction and office of the prelate to be unlawful was resumed by consent of the whole Kirk. An ordinance made that bishops betake themselves to the charge of one congregation and that they exercise no civil jurisdiction. The confession of faith sworn and subscribed wherein they oblige themselves to continue in the doctrine and discipline of this Kirk. The same year it was declared in the General Assembly that the office of the prelate was unlawful in itself and had no warrant from the word of God, therefore renewed in covenant. Thereafter renewed in covenant. Dundee, 1580, often called the King's Covenant. The prelate and men of that disposition, having in the end nothing to oppose, to oppone, professed that they agreed in their consciences, consented to the acts of the Kirk, swore to and subscribed the confession of faith, renewed the covenant with the Kirk, and helped to put on the capstone of the Kirk of God with their own hands. Like as the same confession of faith was subscribed by those that are now in the proudest places of prelacy, and who have proved since the chief instruments of all the alterations in the discipline and external worship of the Kirk. Of, uh, in the worship of God, and ringleaders in defection of this Kirk. With what conscience may be seen by their dishonest excuses, their poor shifts, and their shameless railings, against which they did once so much reverence, all to be seen as they are published in print. 4. The pastor and men of God, desiring to testify their thankfulness for so singularly, singular favor vouchsafe unto this Kirk and nation, and to employ the benefit of the discipline now established for the liberty of the kingdom of Christ, and against the tyranny of sin and Satan, address themselves as all one man, with great fidelity and courage for the work of God, urge residents and diligence and ministers, kept with success from heaven their public and solemn humiliations, made the pulpits to sound against papistry and profaneness, and set all men on work, as they had grace or place, for purging the country of all corruptions, and defending the Kirk against their professed enemies, who never ceased by negotiating with the Pope and the Spanish king, unnaturally to labor for their own and her ruin, where the divine providence had disappointed them in 1588. That's when the Papists were defeated by the great storm that uh, destroyed their ships. They were going to invade England. The prelate's authority at this time lay dead, <clears throat> and men of that disposition made no great din. But the Kirk then, unlike with that which he is now, comely as Jerusalem, terrible as an army with banners against all their enemies, did stand whole and sound in unity, in concord of her ministers, authority of her assemblies, divine order of her ministry, purity of external worship, with great power and presence of the Spirit of God, many congregations of the land, till at last for unity division entered into the Kirk. Prelacy that had slept before was wakened again. And this ministry began to work anew, neither by any cause offered by the pastors of the Kirk at the 17th of December, as the enemy culminates. For after long trial they, did found, they were found faultless and faithful by His Majesty's own testimony, nor yet upon that occasion for the meaning of the Kirk for making the charge was indicted uh, before the 17th day. That's Perth, 1596. But the cause was a plot contrived before for procuring peace to the Popish lords, to make war among the ministry, and to divide lands among themselves. For this effect, 55 problems were framed to call the established discipline of the Kirk in question, and at one end of the same time, way was made for reconciliation of the Popish lords and for the restitution of the Popish prelates. And the schism of our church so well compacted before began at that time not upon their part who stand for the discipline, but by some of the prelates' disposition, that is, a flattering and worldly-minded ministers who gave other answers to the 13 of the 55 articles concerning the government of the Kirk than their worthy brethren desired, so that if the cause or occasion maketh the, the schismatic, the prelate is the schismatic and not the pastor. Number five. The pastor and men of God, as they had been diligent to establish the government of the Kirk according to the will of Christ, and after it was, by the blessing of God established, were faithful in using it for the honor of God and the good of the Kirk, so now, when it began craftily to be called in question, were careful, according to their office and oath, to stand... <laughs> excuse me, to stand to the defense thereof, both against professed enemies and against the schism begun by their own brethren. Albeit they could not at the first have been persuaded that their brethren would never so foully forget themselves as against their great oath in the sight of God and the world, to take upon them the dominion of prelates and as for their own back and belly, to trouble the Kirk and mar all the worship of God as they have done. The prelates, through the schism at that time, begun by himself, savoring with sweetness the wealth and honor, forgetteth his oath, his office, and all, followeth greedily upon the scent, and climbeth craftily, by degrees and betimes, to the height, 
that he could not advance himself to at once. First, with much ado and many protestations, he meant nothing against discipline established, but desired to vindicate the ministry from poverty and contempt. He gets liberty to vote in Parliament for the Kirk, but with such caveats as would have kept him from his present prelacy if he had kept them as he was obliged. Secondly, five years thereafter he was made constant moderator, and that of the Presbytery only where he was resident, and not of the synods, upon his fair precepts with alike prosultations and cautions. Thirdly, being Lord of Parliament, Lord of Council, patron of benefices, modifier of ministers' stipends, he was armed also with the power of the High Commission, and having two swords might do against the Kirk which he, what he pleased. That was uh, done in February 1610. Thereafter, in, incontinent, he usurped the power of ordination and jurisdiction. That's November 1610. And at last, albeit without consent or knowledge of the Kirk of Scotland, went and resumed consecration in England. Okay, that was 1610, November 1610. And since that time, have taken upon him and have exercised the plainer power and office of a bishop in the Kirk, no less than if the assembly of this Kirk had chosen him to to the name and the office of a bishop, which as yet they never have done. The most corrupt of their own assemblies granting only the negative power of ordination and jurisdiction to them, who are never called bishops by any warrant from the Kirk, but only in the vulgar speech from the titles they had to benefices, in which respect civil persons beneficed, beneficed were called bishops in former times. Number six. The pastor and men of God, seeking neither profit nor preferment to themselves, expelled the prelate and all his ceremonies out of the Kirk of Christ. By no other means but by, but such as became faithful ministers of Christ as preaching, praying, writing, advising, with the best reformed Kirks, reasoning and assemblies, and after liberty granted to all to oppone the consent, oath, and subscription of the adversaries. The prelate, seeking nothing but his own profit and preferment, is restored again. By such mean is better beseem his ministers who hath been a murderer and a liar from the beginning than his sincere ministers of Jesus Christ for craft and cruelty. Cruelty hath been their ways. Their craft was to remove their strongest opponents out of the country, that they might not be present in assemblies to espy their proceedings, and to reason against them, to abolish the true liberty and authority of assemblies, to protect that they were seeking no pre to protest that they were seeking no prelacy, neither of the Popish nor English kind and that they had no purpose to subvert the discipline received, but to deliver the Kirk from disgrace, and to be more mighty, to oppose her enemies, Jesuits and Papists, to falsify the acts of the Kirk, to promise to keep all the cautions and conditions made to hold them in order, which now they profess they never minded to do, etc. Their cruelty hath been to boast, to banish, imprison, deprive, confine, silence, etc. Number seven. The pastor and the men of God, all this time of defection, gave testimony to the truth, opposed the several steps of the prelate's ambition by all the means that became, became them to use, as public preaching, supplicating, reasoning, protesting, and suffering. And when the prelate was triumphing in the height of his dignity, they could not, comparing the first temple with the second, but declare the grief of their hearts for the change and the great fear of alteration to be made in the worship of God, when now the hedge of the kirk was broken down, and an open way made for all corruption. The prelate is of the clergy that seldom, that seldom are seen penitent, and therefore as against all the means used by the pastor, he had altered the government of the kirk. So he enters next upon the worship and service of God, and will have new confession of faith, new catechism, new forms of prayer, new observation of days, new forms of ministration of the sacraments which he first practiced himself against the acts and order of the Kirk, and since convened an assembly of his own making to draw on the practice of others. And thirdly, he hath involved the honorable estates of the kingdom into his great guiltiness by their ratification in Parliament, which hath brought an in undulation of evils into this Kirk and country. Number eight. The pastor and men of God, considering what the Kirk was before, and what it is now, what the Reformation was, and what conformity is, what the proceedings of the one and the other have been, seeing religion wearing away, he pitieth the young ones that have never seen better times, laments over the multitude that cannot see the evils of the present, and resolveth for himself to hold constant to the end against papists, prelates, Arminians, and whatever can arise, to wait with patience what the Lord will do for his people. And when he is gone, to leave a testimony behind him of the twofold misery of impiety and iniquity, that he hath seen in this land. The prelate hath forgot what himself 
and the kirk were once. He hath wrought a great defection in this kirk in the short time of his episcopy, then was in the primitive kirk for some hundreds of years, and is so far blinded with the love of the place in this world that he maketh this worldly credit the canon, and his prelacy the touchstone for the trial of all religion. The Pope shall no more be Antichrist. Papistry may be born with. Arminianism may be brought in because they can keep company with prelacy. The Reformation is Puritanism, preciseness, separation, and in intolerable because it cannot cohabit with prelacy. The gods of the nations were social and could live together, but the God of Israel is a jealous God. The prelate's objection. The prelate will object that, albeit he can neither justify all his own proceedings of late, not yours of old, as all men have their own infirmities. If they are yet, yet that ye do him wrong by your deduction, in confounding times it should be distinguished. Because from the Reformation to the coming of some scholars from Geneva, with presbyterial discipline, this kirk was ruled by prelates, and the superintendents in the beginning were the same in substance that the prelates are now. The pastor's answer. All men have their own infirmities, but good men are not presumptuously bold for the love of the world, to hold on in a course of defection against so many obligations from themselves and so many warnings from good men. Infirmity is one thing, and presumption is another. The pastors of the Kirk of Scotland had begun to root out bishopry and to condemn it in their assemblies before these scholars came from Geneva, but never condemned, but allowed the charge of superintendents appointed for a time in the beginning of the Kirk, the one for the other being different in substance. Okay, the superintendents were, Knox didn't like it, but they were basically supposed to be a temporary thing due to the, they had a lack of pastors and so forth. First, the superintendent, according to the canon of the Kirk, was admitted as another minister without consecration of any bishop. The prelate is chosen for fashion by dean and chapter, without any canon of the Kirk, and with solemn consecration of the metropolitan and their bishops. Second, the superintendent appropriated not the power of ordination and jurisdiction, but both remained common to other ministers. The prelate hath taken to himself the power to ordain and depose ministers and to decree excommunication. Third, the superintendents made not a hierarchy of arch superintendents and others inferior, some general and some provincial, some primates and some suffragans, some archdeacons and some dean, some archdeans and deans, etc. The prelates have set up a hierarchy of all these. Fourth, the superintendent was subject to the censor not only of the national but also the provincial kirk, wherein he superintended. The prelate is subject to no censor but may do what and may go whither he will, and no man ask him why he hath done so. <coughs> Fifth, the superintendent's charge was merely ecclesiastical and more in preaching than in government. The prelate is more in ruling than in preaching and more in the world than in the kirk. Sixth, the superintendent acknowledgeth his charge to be but temporary and often desired to lay it down before the general assembly. The prelate think his office to be perpetual by reason and by virtue of his consecration. Seventh, the superintendent had no greater power than the commissioners of provinces. And in respect of the superintendents, he was neither a commissioner from the Kirk of the Kirk than an office bearer essentially different from the pastor. The prelate neither have received commission from the Kirk nor mean it to render a reckoning to them, nor account of himself as a commissioner, but think of his office as essentially diverse from the office of the pastor, as the pastor's office is from the deacons. The Pope may, may as well say that the evangelists were popes as the prelate. The superintendents were prelates. Now, we'll stop there and uh, start a new chapter. That's the end of that chapter. <clears throat> uh, this is a very clever and very brilliant book. And <clears throat> the Reformation was successful. Prelacy was destroyed. And then the prelates tried to worm their way back in through deception. And that's what all heretics and people who want to corrupt the worship of God do. And they would actually go to England and they'd be ordained by bishops in private. It was really slimy. But this is a good book. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for Calderwood. We thank you for the First and Second Reformation of Scotland. We pray for a reformation in our day when all the corruptions in worship and doctrine would be cast out of Presbyterian churches and they would return to their covenants, return to their standards and be faithful and not swear to the, to the Westminster standards with crossed fingers as they do now. In Jesus' name, amen.